Hi everybody, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. I can be found pretty much everywhere as Well for Pearls. And I wanna thank you and welcome you to this place. Thank you for being here. This is episode 235. How are you? It is Tuesday afternoon. It is February 22nd, 2022. I'm sorry if there's any feedback there. I just turned off all my speakers. Um, it is sunny here. We have beautiful blue skies, but it is like minus three because we've got this wind chill. So it's like minus 13 with the wind chill. So it is cold, cold, cold. James refused to wear pants to school this morning. He wanted to, he always wears shorts. Always. If you've ever met him, he's always in shorts and he refused to take a jacket. So he is reaping the consequences of his choices. <laughs> just like rah! so uh, I hope that it is warmer where you are and I hope that your lunch recess and your uh, you know if you're if your kids are at school I hope that they are dressed warmly <laughs> uh, Nora's soccer practice was actually canceled this evening already so um, we because the fields are frozen so uh, we know that like it's you know just we're all sort of affected by all of this weather. So yeah, Vicky says, oh, James. Yes. Oh, oh dear. So it's good to see everybody. Uh, I called this episode pause because this past week, I feel like we literally were pausing. Um, the kids kind of unexpectedly, accidentally, it's kind of just the way it worked out. They ended up with two weeks off, which is totally fine. Um, they had massive portfolio reviews for term two this past week. So a week ago today, we were actually on Zoom with their teachers, one after the other, going through all of their stuff and, and what they've accomplished to this point in the year, what they want to accomplish for the rest. And, um, just sort of, uh, you know, looking at, at their learning outcomes and whatnot. But what ended up happening was they're basically at home for two weeks um, because of not having any classroom time. So I feel really behind on everything. I feel like I've kind of let things get kind of go astray a little bit, if you will. Um, I haven't been putting in like I just haven't had a chance to even sit down at the desk. This morning was the first time. Um, so trying to do stuff on my phone, which I, I don't love. Um, and then they've had some major, major, big, big, big projects due. So then uh, that sort of affected everything as well because they're really trying to get a, get a good start and get a good handle on this stuff. So lots going on and uh, lots happening. I just want to make sure that everybody, that all the links are working and everything. Yes, we've got everything working. So, um, yeah, so I didn't really do anything. Like, I didn't really get anything done. I didn't work on anything. I didn't, like, I, I, we were just sort of totally focused on the kids and what they needed and what was going on. So I literally ended up having this big pause. Like, I just didn't work on anything. So I do have a minor sort of small start project that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I haven't made very much, if any, progress on any of my knitting. And I did start spinning or continued to spin on my Cormo fleece that I've been spinning on my spindles. It's my sweater spin for the year. And, uh, but I like, it's, there's no progress. Do you know what I mean? Like I didn't start a new spindle and have any major you know, reflections that I felt like I needed to share with everybody. Like I just kind of paused. So I hope that, you know, a little bit of a quieter show will be okay with everyone. Um, we've got some really wonderful community participation to share with you guys last week. I have to tell you what ended up happening last week. Funny story. So you know how last week there was all that technical stuff and um, the camera died and all the things. So what ended up happening was we had a, a power surge and I guess one of the cameras wasn't properly plugged into the power source, so it, was it wasn't getting enough juice. So as soon as there was the power surge, everything just um, basically flickered and died, but everything like came back immediately. But the camera didn't have enough juice to like keep going. So you know how I kind of tried to switch the cameras around? Um, there was one of the cameras wasn't hooked up properly into OBS. So it was showing you guys everything and you were seeing everything. But I actually on the back end didn't have the tech, the technology, like it wasn't quite right basically, which is totally fine. You know, I fixed it. But then right after um, the podcast, like 
finished with you guys and we were done because we went way over because of um, all the technical stuff. Um, we had a massive power failure. So the surge kind of came before the power failure and we were out of power for basically um, the rest of the day. So it was kind of one of those weird weeks and then that kind of just set the tone for like the remainder of the week. It was just like tech failure after tech failure. It was really weird. So I just gave up. I was like, I'll do everything on my phone and I'll focus on the kids and that's what'll end up happening. So if you're watching these episodes later, that's what happened last episode. And so now this episode, hopefully everything will be fine. So thank you to all who are in the chat. We've got Sarah and Dagmar's here. Uh, Janine is here from New England, Germany. Um, Tessa's here. She's in Burnaby. She's, she's, she says she's halfway between Vancouver and Woolen Spinning Land. <laughs> you're not wrong, Tessa. Um, Let's see. Uh, oh, she just got, she's celebrating the new recent re arrival of her new comp ski minstrel. Congratulations, Tessa. That's wonderful. We're, we're wheel twins now. Uh, Kim is here from Tennessee. Sam from Wales. Dana is from Southern California. Um, Dorothy is here and Kathy, Mia, Alberto. It's good to see all of you guys. Lulu, um, Glenda, I'm trying to scan through the list. Charlotte is here and Elizabeth, Eve. Karen, Vicky, Leanne, Jennifer, Pia. It's good to see you guys. Oh, Pia's working during, she's watch, sneaking the stream while she's working, so we have to be quiet. Um, Sharon from Western Washington. It's good to see everybody. Thank you for coming. So let's get into the show, and I will tell you guys about my little project that's right over here, the other, my other left. Because um, in real life, it's over here. <laughs> Isn't that confusing? So when I point at it here, <laughs> It's actually over here. That's why it's confusing. And I'll see you guys on the other side. I love that you guys are sneaking the stream during work. I just, that makes my, my heart, uh, makes my heart sing. Um, not that I'm one for slacking off. It's just that I just love that, you know, for some of you, it's towards the end of your work day. So you probably can kind of, you know, move things around a little bit. I just think that's awesome. Um, isn't it fun being easily amused? I know, right, Eve? Totally. Um, so I started a wee little project. It's just a wee ditty of a thing. It's just tiny and it's been so much fun. So I haven't really been working on much else. I do have a brand new spin on my wheels. Um, it is a BFL Beaumont blend that actually Eve um, uh, gifted me. Um, but I, I can't really share it with you or show it to you um, because it's actually physically like on the wheel. But I guess I can show it to you here. It's just a roving. Um, I'm pulling it from the inside. It's a little bit neppy and a little bit dry, I, I told Eve. Um, it's the Beaumont um, BFL. Like they, the mill couldn't deal with uh, just the Beaumont, the Beaumont on its own. So that's why they combined it with other things. So I had spun the uh, Beaumont alpaca back last year. And then there was this um, uh, BFL Beaumont. And it's quite lovely. It's just that it's a bit neppy and it's a little bit dry. But I've actually started spinning it long dry. I kind of started off with like a continuous back. But because I want to spin it really, really, really fine um, to match the Tofino Road Trip, which is a BFL silk, um, I wanted to... Um, uh, stick with that same sort of grist and so I'm spinning it quite fine and um, I'm just working my way through it. So I am hoping that for next week I'll have some video of actually spinning it and I can talk to what I'm actually doing at the wheel because it's a little bit challenging to do that when I'm actually like podcasting with you guys. It's better to have an insert that I can actually record and stream with you guys in and talk to it while the video is playing, if that makes sense. So um, I'll share a little bit more with you about that next week, but I am spinning for a finished wraps per inch of somewhere around 24 
uh, wraps print, which I, th I think is what I wrote down and what I want to do. So, um, oh, that's so interesting, Eve. So the Beaumont and the BFL cross is actually the sheep. It wasn't combined at the well mill. I guess I kind of just assumed that it was combined at the mill. Um, okay, so it's actually the sheep itself. So it's actually um, the sheep. That makes more sense, actually, because it's very even and it's very consistent. So I was wondering um, about that because it didn't really feel like a blend. So that really helps. That totally makes sense. Um, oh, I'm glad, uh, Janine. Yeah, so she's uh, we're keeping her company while she's working. Hi, Allie. Good to see you. She's popping in from Adelaide in Southern Australia. That's wonderful before she has to go to work. And uh, it's good to see you too, Dion, because you popped in there as well. So what have I been working on? It's this stuff right here. So let me go to a different camera and I will share with you guys uh, what I've been working on. So these are the X and O's coasters, X's and O's. X's and O's is just, it's a, it's a woven pattern um, and that's not what I wanted. And um, I have pulled this out of my stash last week. So you guys knew about this because I had sort of talked to it last week. Um, Amanda Rattage, she's based in Ontario. Uh, she's, a, she's a weaver and an artist. She went to um, uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design, so OCAD, for those who kind of know um, some of the schools in, in Ontario. And um, she publishes patterns on her website. Um, I have linked... I, I think I linked it all in the show notes, but if not, I'll update it later and fix it later. And uh, I think it's amandaretage.com, I think, but I might be wrong. Um, anyway, so I had pulled these, I had seen these on Instagram uh, by somebody else, and I sort of, I really liked them, and then they popped up again, and then they popped up again. And I just thought, you know, I've got some Herdwick on my stash. I bet you that would be great, because I don't have enough for an actual... Um, you know, big knit or a really big woven rug or something. But I've got this, these, these kind of, you know, sample skeins that were both about 50 grams each of Herdwick, you know, quite Kempy, quite neppy. You can see all that white on there. That's all Kemp. That's all stuff that's going to fall off and come off and come apart. And it's all Kemp. And, um, I just kind of thought, you know, and, and could, this was originally from Katrina's Fiber Club years ago when she was still doing a Fiber Club. And uh, there's Sari Silk in here, and uh, there's some color, and like it's just really, really fun. There's some Silk Noil, some bits and bobs. It's just fun, but it's coarse, and it's, it's a, like it's rug wool. And I wasn't, and then this one is from Sarah Elizabeth uh, Fiberworks in Nelson, British Columbia, just outside Nelson. And uh, same thing, like lots of Kemp, lots of guard hairs, lots of, lots of sort of texture, but it's just really, really fun yarn. You know, there's sparkle in there and some sari silk and whole bunch of texture. I think she calls these her textured ladies or something like that. It's really cute. And uh, you know, what do you do with them when they're that, coarse against the skin. Like I can't knit a toque and expect to wear it unless it was just the back part of the toque. I'd have to do something else for the band, which would be okay. So I thought I'd throw this on the loom. So in terms of the way that the fabric is designed, I'll just catch the chat before I move on. Um, if you're fulling those in the dryer, uh, might I suggest an old towel? Yeah, so I actually am probably not going to put them in the washer and dryer. Um, I think that they'll actually be, I think it would actually ruin them um, now that I've been weaving on them and working on them for a while. So the pattern calls for 8-4 cotton and you wind the smallest warp ever. I think I had it wound in like 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. It's just a baby warp. It's really, really fast. And your two ends at either ends are your floating salvages. So part of the warp is your floating salvages. But then once I got it warped, I realized that these two yarns, they don't have enough contrast between them. And it's a weft faced fabric. So if you look at my hands as I'm passing the shuttles back and forth, you can see that the warp that the 8-4 cotton is completely covered by what I'm weaving with. So the, the yarns that I'm putting over top are completely covering that warp. So this is a weft faced fabric. So that means that you, all you see is the weft. And um, 
that's really fun. But I wasn't totally sure how much yarn I would end up using up because in the pattern she says that she wove about eight coasters off of the 1.4 yard warp and I wound about 1.6 yards. And I can see that if I wanna make many more, like if I wanna make a whole set with this skein, I'm gonna to have to re-warp and put another, uh, another, another skein on. So um, I had to go back into my stash. I had to go stash diving again and see what I could put for the contrast color. So I found a couple of things. Um, <laughs> Vicky's like, I love this. Um, oh, I'll talk about that in a second, Dion. Um, great question, what are you weaving on? So I found these two skeins in my stash. This was, this actually came with my Kromsky Minstrel. Between you, me, and the, and the house fly on the wall, um, it, it wasn't a lovely spin. I, did, I didn't enjoy this very much, but it was a lot of fiber, and it came with my Kromsky Minstrel. It was just some Romney, um, and it was just one of those things you know, I, I was hoping to use it with something else I had spun, but it came out a bit too thick. Um, however, this two-ply Romney that, you know, is sort of a little bit toothy and a little bit round and a little bit thicker than what I wanted is the perfect contrast color for this Herdwick. So that's what the second yarn is there, is this Romney. And I started off with a skein that two skeins that were significantly bigger before I started weaving. That is one thing. Dep Regardless of whether you guys use your hand spun or not and dive into your stashes, whatever you decide to do, if you do decide to make this, um, you absolutely have to make sure that you've got, you're going to have enough yarn um, because these coasters are using a lot of yarn. I think, but I think by the time I finish this set with the Herdwick, the Crafty Jacks Herdwick, I suspect that I'll have used this whole skein. I just, um, I'm halfway through the third bobbin right now. And you can see here as I'm weaving, um, you know, the I, you can't overfill your bobbins because you're dealing with like this worsted weight yarn. Um, the pattern calls for let low P. So that gives you an idea of kind of the weight of these yarns. Um, and you thread, you slay your reed at eight ends per inch. So this is eight four cotton. It's normally woven in plain weave at about 12 ends per inch. And you're opening up your set to eight ends per inch. So that's the number of warp threads per inch. Um, you're opening it up from 12 down to eight. And generally eight for cotton is woven at 14 for twill. So that just kind of gives you an idea of how, how truly open this is. And um, as you work your way up and you make those X's and you make those O's, um, you know, you're packing down that weft quite significantly to cover your warp. Um, I may be packing it a little bit too much, but the thing is, is that those O's in the pattern, you want them to be circles. So if you don't pack them, um, not like really, really aggressively, but you know, enough that you kind of, you know, give it a, a tap tap. Um, they don't come out as, as circles. They'll be oval and you want your O's to like be circles. <laughs> so, um, maybe not flat circles, but you want them to have a certain shape to them. And then the other thing that I did is if you look, um, at the first T the first coaster that's there down, uh, like in the lower, your lower right hand corner of your monitor, there's the, the O's that are just gonna go over the front apron rod, they're just gonna go over the front beam there, sorry, and, and wrap around the apron rod at the front there. I reversed the colors. So I did the O's in the this sort of creamy corn color. Corn was the colorway name. Um, and I did the uh, background in the Herdwick. So that used more yarn as well. Um, but to be honest with you, I kind of like both. I, I like the, the white background, but I also like with the darker letters. And then I also like the lighter letters with the darker background. So I thought it, that was kind of, it's kind of neat. Like it's, and it's so much fun watching the, I'm sure you guys are all staring at the weaving. Like it's so much fun to watch the, the letter actually like be created. It's so, so fun. Um, so the pattern is from, it's, it's the X's and O's. It's right here, right, right where I'm talking. It's right here. The it's, it's right here. <laughs> X's and O's coasters by Amanda Rattage. And it's from like, I think it's amandarattage.com. I think. Um, so Dion is wondering what I'm weaving on. So this is my Louette 
Jane table loom. Um, it's a 60, it's a 15 inch wide loom. Uh, Dorothy actually has one as well. I had actually folded it up and put it away because I was sort of planning on doing some other things on my other looms and I didn't really need this loom at this point, but I ended up actually pulling it out because, um, I didn't really have a free loom to put these on and, and I wanted to uh, just work on something really small and the threading was a little bit too complicated to put it on a rigid heddle. It's not um, it's not like a one two like you need you need a four shaft loom. So if you have your uh, your loom set up as four shafts you can to your your rigid heddle you can totally weave these. Um, it's like one two three four one two one four, three, two, one, one, uh, th two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, four, three, two, one, two, three, four. So that's the repeat. It's pretty universal. You can look up X's and O's online. Um, Amanda gives you all of the information about like what to set it at, how many ends to wind, um, what yarns you want to use. Like she gives you all of that information, um, for your hem stitching, how many, how many ends do you want in each of your little loops when you're hem stitching. So she gives you all of that information. Um, but this isn't a new, a new draft or a new pattern. So uh, if you can do all four shafts, if you can, if you have your your rigid heddle set up that way, you could, you could probably do it. But this is a table loom, and it's actually kind of perfect because you don't need really really high tension. It's just a little project. It's like a little baby project, and it's just perfect for this application. Um, because my Jane is only 15 inches wide, I can weave 30 inches if I set it up for double weave. Um, but for this situation with the coasters, um, it just works beautifully. They're 4.75 inches wide with draw-in, which is very minimal. Um, once they're, once you're weaving on the loom and then, um, they're 4.75 inches square. So that's sort of when you do your O X O X O pattern, um, after you do your two picks of eight, four cotton to anchor it and hold it all in place, uh, you're looking at about, um, 4.75 inches square. So I hope that, um, answers everybody's questions. Um, wouldn't the reverse be underneath as well? Yes, Kathy, I, I, I'm, I think so. I haven't actually looked. Isn't that terrible? I haven't actually looked, but I'm, I'm positive it's the reverse underneath, which is really fun. The one thing I will say is when I first started working on these, I got it all warped, uh, like within like 20 or 30 minutes. It was so fast. Um, but once I got it threaded and I got it slayed and I got it tied on, once I started actually going to like weave it, um, I found the draft was really hard to follow because for each your O's and your X's, you, you have like 23, 25, something like that, somewhere in the mid twenties, um, rows of weaving. So you've got all of that running down the side of your draft. And I found it really hard to keep track of. And I kept, I had a, a pin that I was moving down, um, as I was working, but I found like it just, the pattern wasn't turning out. And I was kind of just finding it really confusing and hard to follow. So I took, um, I took the draft and I sat down and I actually took a little piece of paper and I actually wrote like one, two, two, three, three, four, one, four, like just one after the other so that I could actually work my way down more systematically. And I got rid of the draft altogether. Um, and then I had some, um, you know, those like pins that go into, into, into hair like this, like they, they're literally like to hold your hair at the, at the salon when they're uh, cutting your hair. Um, I don't know what they're called. Um, Anyways, I used those and I just kept moving it down and it worked, it worked really, really well. So yeah, that is it. I can't believe we watched the whole video. I was not expecting us to do that. So, <laughs> so that was fun. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to share with you, I'll go to my big camera here so that you can see this. Um, I took samples of the yarns and I threw them into my project book. I have to move these over here. Um, they just take up too much space because they're thick. Like these are all worsted weight hand spun yarns. So they're all um, between eight and 10 wraps per inch. So they're much thicker than the yarns that I normally would use. So I think I shared this with you guys before. Um, so what I did was um, 
I've just been keeping my notes in here. So I, I wrote down like these are all the samples of these particular ones because I suspect I'm going to have to do a second warp with the blue, um, with the blue ones. Um, which is kind of nice because then I can change the 8-4 cotton color because I used the yellow because I couldn't find my white 8-4 cotton, but I've since found it. So um, things are really organized over here right now and I know exactly where everything is. <sighs> we're in the middle of Renos. I don't know if I told you guys, we're doing our floors and our baseboards and we're painting the whole house. This is gonna look different behind us here. Um, everything's gonna shift and change. So it's just kind of created a little bit of um, havoc in the house, a little bit like things are put away, but they're not put away. And so anyhow, so I've got all of the information here about the warp, the weft, um, that it was my hand spun, and then some of the initial measurements. So it'll be really interesting to see coming off the loom what this all looks like. And what I like about this is that, you know, now I have a piece of the actual, you know, the yarns that I used and you can see um, in real life, probably not on the camera, but you can see all of the Kemp and all of the texture in this yarn. So it's really, it'll be really fun to see the finished coasters because over time what's going to happen is and it's already happening on the loom. The Kemp is going to come out. So um, it'll take, it'll take while, a while, but um, yeah, it'll, it'll all fall out. So then it'll be fun to have that original, that initial um, sample there along with what the Romney looked like before washing and finishing. So for washing and finishing, um, Eve had asked about the uh, fulling in the dryer. I'm not sure I'm going to be super, super aggressive with fulling these. I think I will probably steam them with the iron and give them a really good press, but I don't think I'll be really aggressive about like getting them wet and fulling them and, you know, felting them and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that I will be, um, uh, quite gentle with these. Um, Dorothy makes in index cards held together with rings. Each card has one treadle instructions on it. And after you complete that treadle, just flip the next card on the deck. Do you find though, Dorothy, by doing that, do you find that like the pause in your weaving that you find it kind of annoying? Like, cause I find with the table loom, part of what I don't like about the table loom is that um, you're constantly putting things down because you have, you need your hand free to change your paddles. Um, so do you find that also having to flip the card, do you find it just sort of, it's one more thing that you have to do or you've put everything down anyways, so it's not that big a deal. I would, I would love to hear what you have to, what you think about that. Um, I do find with the Jane, there's nowhere to put stuff. So there's no like, like on the, on the rigid heddle, Heddles, for example, the Ashfords, there's trays on the side on the stand. And so you've got somewhere to put stuff. Um, and on the Jane, there's, even though I have a stand, there's nowhere to put stuff except for up top. So I often end up laying the shuttles like on the fabric itself. But these are so small that I did drop my shuttles quite a few times at the beginning as I was getting like fabric um, as it was starting out. So I would, um, yeah, it, I don't have a little table right there to rest anything on. And I, I mean, I can move it. It's not a big deal. It's just a little, a little loom, but yeah, I just, it's nice to hear other people's process. Um, Eve said, you'll still be looking for things months after the renos. It's so true. It's so true, isn't it? So this has been really helpful because now I'm actually starting, now that I've been using it for the last, um, few weeks since I got it made. Um, I'm actually starting to like amass quite a few projects. So like this was my twill gamp that I finished off the other week. Um, this was my overshot sampler, starting that, getting that going, the initial yarns that I had used. Um, I've introduced more yarns since then, so I'll have to add to this, but that's okay. And then my color gamp. So I've got lots, lots of stuff kind of starting to amass in here. And that's really, that was the whole point. That was the whole reason for wanting to make this. So super fun. It's a bit slow. I have two small bags that I tie one on each side of the beam. Oh, interesting. Okay, Dorothy, I'll have to talk to you about that a little bit more. Yeah, the Jane, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, super interesting. All right, we are going to go into community participation, so I will see you on the other side. All right, so I hope I have the right names here. I'm not sure that I do. No, I don't. 
but I have the right people in the chats, like in the queued up and ready to share. So that's okay. So at least I have that. <laughs> um, figuring it out as we go, you guys, figuring it out as we go. Um, sometimes I, I just wonder like, you know, do you ever have those moments where you're like, how in the tarnation do I even get dressed in the morning? Like, you know, you just sort of, you feel like you've got all these balls in the air and you're like, I know I'm doing it, but how am I doing it? I'm not really sure. Um, I added a, um, I added one actually, uh, right at the end. I, 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 I had the show all queued up and ready to go. And then I, uh, I added an extra community participation and I actually, it's, there's no photo to go with it or anything. So I think we'll talk about it here on the bigger camera so that you're not looking at a black screen. But it was a question that popped up in Ravelry and I thought it was a really, really good one. Um, it's from Cassidy and she says, I'm a new spinner. I've been do using a drop spindle and spinning for about two weeks. Get your fingers ready because I want to know what your uh, thoughts are about this. My question is, should I be taking notes? So she's been spinning for about two weeks and she's wondering if she should be taking notes. If so, what should I take notes on? Good question. I know note taking is important when dying so you can replicate your results, but what about spinning? I know I should label the yarn I've spun, but I don't know what I need to remember about how it was spun. Any help is much appreciated. So I would love to hear from you guys what your thoughts are about this. Um, I certainly have my thoughts and I will share them with you, but I, I would really like to hear from you guys what you think. So um, I would say to somebody who is such a new spinner and has only been making yarn for two weeks that you probably just need to enjoy the process right now of making yarn. Um, there's very little that you're going to be doing at this stage in your, in your journey that is going to uh, be anything that you're either going to want to or be able to recreate in the future. Um, the yarns that you make in those first, in that first few months, if not year, um, are so special in the sense that they're your initial yarns. You're just playing, you're learning about things. You're only taking on so much, um, from your, um, sort of repertoire of knowledge that you have, which is very limited at this point. Um, that you can't take into all account all of the things that you need to be thinking about for every single spin. I've also stopped taking as many notes as I used to. Um, and I think at that time in my sort of spinning journey, I needed to take a lot of notes and I needed to have my samples and have everything organized so that I knew what I was doing, why I was doing it and what the purpose was. But now I've kind of moved to the other side where I don't actually keep a ton of notes and I don't actually keep a ton of spin control cards and all the stuff that I tell you guys to do um, because I don't tend to spin as much as I used to. Um, when I do have a really big spin like the Beaumont BFL, I'll do a control card for that and I will um, keep my notes for that. But for something like 10 grams of Tessa that we're talking about on the podcast or that I'm sharing with you guys um, on the School of Sweet Georgia, I don't tend to do a lot of notes and keep a lot of uh, records about that because the reality is I'm probably not going to spin that yarn again. Or if I am, I can probably reverse engineer it and figure out what I did and get it close enough. Um, so it really depends on what it is that you are looking for in your spinning. But being such a new spinner at this stage of the game, what you need to label your skeins with is what is the fiber? What is it? Um, you just need to put a label on it after you've washed it and you've hung it to dry and it's done all of its magical changing because you know we know that yarn changes when you, when you wash and finish it. So when people talk about washing and finishing their yarn, at this point, all you probably need to be doing is taking your beautiful skein, make sure it's tied in a few different places so that it doesn't fall apart. So at least three or four ties around the circumference of your skein, put it in some warm soapy water, not hot, just warm, back of your hand warm, soak it, 
and then rinse it and then hang it to dry. You know, give it give it a good squoosh down. You don't want to you don't want to twist it and wring it, but you know, give it a good squoosh down, get all that extra water out of it and then literally hang it to dry. Um, you know, in the shower, off the curtain rod, whatever, whatever works. And, and then label it, like what is it? Um, that's one of the things that I found with some of these old skeins. Like I spun this back in 2000 and, this is our guild tag for the guild sale. And this was probably 2015, maybe 2016, maybe. Um, I used to not put what the fiber content was of my skeins. So there's yarns that I have upstairs that are from when I first came back to spinning after a long hiatus. Um, I don't know what they are. I don't know if they're Corydale. I don't know if they're Perindale, uh, BFL. Like I'm, I just don't know. Um, it probably doesn't matter. It's some sort of a medium wool. It doesn't really matter. Um, but it is nice to look back and see what it was that you spun and what it is that you made. So I would encourage you to throw a label on with what it is. Um, especially if it's a blend, if it's like a, you know, BFL silk or merino nylon or, you know, something. As you progress in your spinning and as you get to that point where you're starting to be more intentional about your yarns, which you will know when you get to that point, because you'll start being a bit frustrated. You'll feel like you've hit a wall. You'll feel like you're creating the same yarns over and over and over again. And you don't really know what you're doing, uh, what you could do to do do, do it differently to create something different. Um, that's when you'll know that you need to start making notes that you need to start being a bit more intentional at the wheel or your spindle, whatever you decide to go with. And that's when you need to start, um, take pot to hitting the pause button theme of the week and, um, uh, seeking out some expert instruction, somebody who can mentor you, um, looking at old videos that we have here on Woolen Spinning that will help you to not only know what you need to record, but why you need to record it. What's your wraps print of your singles? What's your wraps print of your finished yarn after washing, before washing? Um, how much twist are you putting into it? Are you putting that twist in over how many inches? Are you doing it short forward? Like all the, which, which wheel did you use? Um, I get very different yarn off of my different wheels. My Lendrums, it's gonna be a little bit underspun, a little bit less twist, because they don't have the really super high ratios. My Mashercraft is gonna be balanced, it's gonna be a well-twisted single and a well-twisted ply. Um, same with my my Ashford E-Spinner 3. Um, with my, uh, with my, my uh, Minstrel, it's gonna be a lot like my, my Lendrum yarns. Um, so you start to kind of figure out what, what where your what yarn you can you can spin on which tool does that make sense so we're going to look at what you guys you have lots to say i've watched chat out of my in my peripheral vision it's been going um so people uh you guys are really really helpful um you guys say i wouldn't take any notes until you're uh, comfortable spinning and i think eve said right now just spin i think two weeks it um it should be all about play right now you guys are totally on the same page as me dorothy says totally one day during residency i got up got dressed went off to work and realized i was wearing two different colored clogs that's awesome dorothy yes sometimes i wonder how are we doing it how are we holding our all everything in the in the air so dana says i take notes on how i split the fiber what whirl i'm spinning on and sometimes i just take pictures that that's perfect like keep it simple and you know as you're learning if you're concerned that you know maybe you've got three or four drop spindles and you're not sure which one is going to produce what type of yarn at this point you know one might be a little bit heavier it's going to make uh, slightly thicker singles it's going to have a little bit less twist in it um, that's just the way it is um, and then maybe one of your spindles that you've bought is lighter and it's going to spin faster and it's going to put more twist into your yarn it's going to spin your yarns a little bit your singles are going to be a little bit finer in, when you compare them so take a picture and then you'll remember that oh yeah the pink fiber was on the smaller spindle and the green fiber was on the thicker spindle right okay now that these yarns are done and they're plied how are they different how are they the same and, and where can I go from here? I think we really grossly underestimate. It doesn't mean you have to post on social media. It doesn't mean you have to be on Instagram. It doesn't mean you have to be on Ravelry. But if you have a running, you know, sort of library of photos in, in your phone or on your smart device, your iPad, whatever you use, um, you can go back and look and say, oh yeah, that was spun on that spindle and, and this is the yarn it made. That's pretty cool, you know. 
Um, Alberto says, yes, the wheel use, the ratio use, the length of draft, S versus V, what fiber, when, it, uh, when it's time to try to repeat the results, absolutely. So as that's for when you get a little bit more advanced. So that might be a couple of months down the road, that might be a couple of years down the road. Everybody learns at a different pace. And some people who never go on to wheels, don't have some of this stuff to think about. They're thinking more about what type of yarn do I get on this specific spindle? What type of yarn do I get on this spindle? Um, and then comparing the differences because you don't have whorls on, um, you know, where well, you do have whorls on spindles. You don't have um, uh, different sizes where you can say, oh, this spindle is 14.5, you know, um, uh, twist per one, one rotation of my drive wheel. Your spindle doesn't have a drive wheel. So you don't have some of those technical numbers. That's not a bad thing. I would argue it's probably a good thing because we get really caught up in the numbers and the technical and we forget that we're just making yarn and that sometimes we need to just go by what the fiber is telling us. Sometimes that's okay too. Often that's okay. Um, I feel like my notes didn't start being helpful until I'd been spinning for a year or two. That's a really good point, Janine. Um, only the past nine plus months, very much what Rachel is saying. Great. Um, I'm, I'm glad that that's resonating with you guys. I'm glad that it's a, that it's consistent, that you guys are feeling that way too. Cause you never know, right? You guys could have said, no, absolutely not. You need to be writing it all down and blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer uses punch, uh, punch holes in an index card and then, uh, relax and spin and keep, keep a sample looping them back through the holes and then brief identify brief notes to trigger your memory. You know, the ratio used, etc. Absolutely. I think that's something to absolutely work towards. I only keep notes as long as I'm spinning for a certain project. Thereafter, the notes will disappear into my stuff. I, I get it, Dagmar, for sure. Um, I also don't take notes when I'm sampling just to try the fiber. My goal is just to see what the fiber wants to do. Absolutely, Dion. Um, should probably mention that wash, rinse water needs to be the same temperature as the wash water. Good point, Eve. Thank you so much because you don't want your, your yarn spelting. Um, yeah, it's important to know about the breed. Um, I'm just scanning the chat just to make sure um, where to find a spinning mentor. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm always available. Absolutely. Um, and there's other people out there that are outstanding and that can help you. There are people that are, do not have podcasts and do, are not on the internets and are just phenomenal people that can help you. And as you develop your, um, you know, spinning repertoire and you kind you know, you, you sort of find out who's local to you and who, you know, um, if you have a local guild, there are teachers and, and mentors that will pop out of the woodwork. Absolutely to help you and to support you. I think, I think that's really great. Uh, Dion says, speaking of spindles, I have three Markwoods arriving tomorrow. That's amazing. Uh, Charlotte says, I'm a note taker, but no format, just impressions, discoveries, learnings, dates, sometimes a sample or a label, no frills, cheapo, uh, composition book. That's awesome. I have to admit, I, I do like reflecting on my stuff. I don't think that I could have created a whole, uh, repertoire of work, you know, vlogs and, um, all of the, um, uh, accessory content that we have at Woolen Spinning if I didn't like writing um, and if I didn't like reflecting on things if I didn't enjoy that process there's no way that I could do the writing that I do every month to release to you guys to the patrons of the show um, uh, to to help you guys and to further your learning and and your mentorship um, there's there's no way if it's not something that comes naturally to you that is okay it doesn't have to it's not for everybody so, um, I hope that that helps Cassidy just get you started and, um, definitely, um, you know, take the pressure off yourself and, and do, do what feels natural and, and feels right and keep asking questions. Like what a great question. It sparked a lot of conversation. So that's great. All right. So onwards with community participation. This is, um, for our Jacob study. This is from Kathy. This, these are all the projects we couldn't share last week. And now I'm even further behind because you guys have shared so much amazing stuff this past week. So now we're going to be like two weeks behind, but you guys will bear with me here. So this is from Kathy. This is amazing. This is her breed and color study project. She was thinking possibly pillow tops for a total of four. She used the gamp in the warp and then crossed with the light, the gray and the dark, which she ran out of and then had to rethink her plan. But aren't these incredible? Um, she was kind of planning on doing this. Uh, sorry. The big question is, um, shall I felt the fabric? 
I was kind of planning on doing this, but I'm unsure about felting it as a large strip of fabric um, or to cut it apart so in the ends and then felt the individual pieces. Any recommendations? I'm going to leave that to you guys. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, for those before you guys all ask, because I'm sure that somebody will ask, this is Rose Path. Uh, this is a Rose Path, path threading. So one, two, three, four, one, four, three, two, one, four, one, two, three, four, one, four, three, two, one, four. So it's like a prolonged point twill kind of. And but then she treadled one, two, three, two, one, two, three, four. So she did like a uh, progression which is really fun and then she did straight draw threading in the multicolored stripe so that's that color that you see there Dion says I love it how it is yes the problem is you can't leave it that way for the actual fabric you've got to you you need to finish the fabric to some extent um, I was actually thinking Kathy what about using the finishing maybe not as aggressively but the finishing that uh, Dorothy that um, Dorothy that Jane Stafford shows in I think it's season three the Harrisville blankets that she does and she folds them in the sink and she just very gently um, you know shifts them around you want to get any residue like anything that's on those towels whether it's spinning oils or you know um uh residue di like dye like anything that's on i know it's hand spun i know that you've already washed the yarn but you know anything that came off your loom you want to get all of that off uh it is for shaft um eve um so I would definitely recommend like at least doing a very, very gentle scour, um, you know, with some, uh, you know, detergent of some kind, um, you know, the, the unicorn fiber wash, just the really gentle stuff, um, just a small amount of that. And just, you could slosh it around in, in warm water, not hot water, but warm water and see what you get for results from fulling that way. And then you could wrap it in a towel and towel dry it um, rather than thwacking it and throwing it around and really beating it up. Um, Cause you could put it in a timed dryer for a few minutes and just keep checking it. But um, yeah, I, I think you, you could do a little bit with this fabric to really make sure that it's um, structurally sound for, for a set of uh, pillows. Cause the thing is, is that if you don't do anything, every time there's any kind of abrasion against those pillows on the couch or wherever you're going to put them, you're going to start getting that, um, you know, the pilling and stuff like you, you want to sort of protect the surface somehow without completely losing your pattern. So yeah, if anybody has any, uh, any thoughts, I think, I think, uh, I would love to hear, uh, Bridget says I soak that sort of thing in a hot, in a tub of hot water and then I hang it to dry. So that's another thought. Um, this is from Pia loved these photos um ps shares this is from our spindle spun stitches um so this is our ongoing you know project uh through to the finished object on your spindles so it's sort of a celebration of all types of spindles just getting us thinking about our spindles and working with our spindles regularly this is from Pia. She's got a three ply fractal coming up. This is spunky eclectic targi that she got from a D stash, mostly so that she could practice spinning thin singles and play with fractals. They're so pretty on the spindles. Yes, yes it is Pia. I wouldn't even want to like wind it off. It's just so pretty. So thank you for sharing. This is from Sarah. Um, this is for our luxury fibers along. So this was all of our, we worked on luxury fibers all the way through last year. It was the focus of all of the teaching content. It was everything that was happening behind the scenes and people are still sharing all of their stuff that they're working on. So I've left it active and left it alive because we're not going to get through some of that content just because I got through it in 12 months. I think may, most of us are on a journey of that's quite a bit longer. So, um, um, so this is from Sarah. She was inspired by the wool circle to get out her wool silk flax blend. It's in a beautiful colorway called birthday cake. The silk is sorry silk and this blend has a few different wools. I don't remember which ones. The larger mini skein is a two ply where I stripped the fiber down before spinning. And then the tiny mini skein is where I blended the fiber a bit with my hand carters. The blended skein was easier to spin as I didn't have large clumps of flax. The colors are a bit muddier, but I expected that 
and I liked spinning the blended skein better. I honestly can't decide which skein I liked. I think they're both beautiful. Well done, Sarah, absolutely beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing because uh, in March, we're gonna be looking um, some more at these at these blends. Um, we'll be reflecting on them. I have to admit, I really like the little blended mini skein. I think it's really pretty. So, but well done on both of them. This is from Suzanne Natural Shades Along. So this is celebrating all things natural shades, every, you know, undyed, beautiful fiber. Um, many of us work with the undyed fiber before we go ahead and, you know, take it to the next step in diet. So I think it's just a really great opportunity to pause and just thank nature for the things that she provides us. It's just amazing. So this is from Suzanne, one of those skeins that will teach you a lesson the hard way. I carded some of my Columbia fleece and spun it in a mix of supported and unsupported long draw. The resulting singles were rather lumpy. I wanted to do a three ply, but didn't want to get out the drill to rewind the weaving bobbins. So I decided to chain ply and it turns out it's better to chain ply a smoother singles. I don't generally chain ply woolen spun yarn. Um, it's really, really hard to chain ply woolen spun yarn. It's generally very lightly twisted. It's it's twist locked, but it's not tightly twisted. And all of pulling pulling off of your bobbin and and having that big long length of singles as you're looping, um, there's a lot of a lot of places that it can break and that you can end up with a lot of havoc. Um, I did get really good at fixing broken singles and it really helped me gain more confidence with chain plying. I'm a learn it the hard way kind of person it seems. Sometimes it feels that way, hey Suzanne? Like sometimes you just feel like, man, that just was hard. This is from Kristen, this is a Zero to Hero. Oh no wait, this is Debbie, sorry. This is from Debbie for Zero to Hero, uh, using your hand spun all the way from the fiber all the way through to the finished project. I knit spun the Radiate Sweater by Hohi Locatelli. This is another Zero to Hero for me. Beautiful photographs, Debbie, beautiful. It's good to see you. This is from Kristen. This is another Zero to Hero. She started sampling for the Illuminate sweater um, back in September and it's finally done. It's my first ever sweater, first time knitting stranded color work, so lots of learning. The contrast color is a single of BFL and a single of Cormo and then she plied them together. And the main color is a three ply from Pin Drafted Roving. The mohair has given it quite, a, quite the halo but I'm happy with about that since the pattern called for mohair held double. Now I'm just crossing my fingers for some cold Florida days so I can wear it. You should come here. We have our wind chill. <laughs> you can come and hang out with us, Kristen. So thank you for sharing that. It's just beautiful. And actually, we, in Queries and Explorations, we got to see her actually wearing it. It looks phenomenal. She did a beautiful job. So really well done. So there is a new along that just started in our community and it was actually a grassroots project from you guys, which is really cool. Um, it's the sock color study and the link is for the Ravelry. Um, but um, there's also um, sort of ongoing discussion happening. I've camp everywhere uh, in the uh, Slack channel. So if you're on the Slack channel, definitely check it out there. And Rebecca has kind of taken the reins on this one. So um, you can follow Rebecca at her blog. I think it's the Priest Crafts. Can somebody help me? And um, she's got all of the information up on Ravelry as well as on her blog. And she's been working through this whole sock study this year, which is really cool. So um, I've linked it in the in the live chat. And uh, this first one is from Shauna. Beautiful spinning. I've been inspired to try spinning a cable plied sock yarn. So if all goes the way I'm hoping, it means it this will be a four ply fingering weight yarn. Not wanting to take a chance on my good wool, I raided my stash and found this braid I'd bought at my first fiber festival, the same one I bought my wheel at. It was over three years ago and it's 113 grams of Cheviot. I've never spun any Cheviot before, so this was also new. It feels coarse, but I don't mind to scratch your wool for socks. I feel like Cheviot always feels a bit coarse when you're spinning it, but it's it's not really, unless it's a real meat sheep that you've sourced it from. But um, I, I feel like as the medium wools, they tend to be um, tricks, tricksy. Like they're kind of a bit, they seem coarse, but they're not really. My Cheviot sweater, The Gentle Morning, is like, it's, to, it's actually softer than this against my skin. Um, and this is a, a tweed that was um, 
uh, has some um, nylon in it, which doesn't scratch at all because it's totally smooth. Funny how that goes. So, uh, so I hope that I hope it's I hope it surprises you. Uh, not only is it a struggle to maintain the thing single, but I also have to add more twists than normal to accommodate for all the plying that will happen. Um, I'm using Rachel's tutorial and will wind a center pull ball from the singles and then ply it on itself and then ply the plied yarn back on itself again. Confused yet? Me too. That's why cabled yarns are so much fun because they're a bit of a mind twister. You got to ply and then you got to ply. So it's good. I'm glad. And I think uh, Sean is still working on this. I don't think that she's shown us the... Uh, finished yarn yet but beautiful spinning Shauna amazing this one is from wait a second I'm getting all mixed up um, where did the post from Dana go there it is this is from Dana I finished a three ply for the Drea uh, for the DRK Drea Renee knits um, Andrea Maori uh, everyday socks uh, spin along knit along the fiber was just a glimpse from hello yarn club it was spun as a fractal split into three into thirds and then spun one, two, four pieces. So she spun it end to end, stripped it twice and then stripped it four times, which is what I've done with my uh, Tofino road trip. I can't wait to get it on the needles and see what it looks like. Amazing yarn, Dana, beautiful. Um, Janine says Cheviot feels really coarse when it's spinning, but a tightly spun four ply feels fine for socks. Um, I'm assuming you've, you've done that Janine. You're speaking from experience. I have to admit, I love Cheviot. It's one of my favorite, favorite wools. So, um, I'm glad that you guys are working with it and using it. So this is just pure play. We, as adults, I've said this before, I will say it a million times. We do not play enough. So this is for our sample spinning and play. Um, this is from Eve. Uh, she's spinning some singles to be used as weft uh, that have, that's already been spun. So the fiber is a Merino Tessa Sari Silk Trilobal Blend. Isn't that beautiful? So that's the yarn she'd already spun. And then she's spinning this other stuff to go with it. It's going to be gorgeous. Lots of texture. This is from Becca. Uh, finished two hats with the remaining Shetland Polwar three ply after finishing my recent knits. She's on a roll. <laughs> she hadn't knit for like 20 months and now she's made like four things. Uh, one for me and one for the gift bag. Um, the pattern is actually my own wraps per inch toque um, and it's a basic one by one ribbed hat from Pearl Soho. Bo both are go-to patterns for me. So the wraps per inch toque, I will link it. It's a Ravelry link. Um, I'll link it in the live chat below and you guys can check that out. Um, it's funny that toque keeps resurfacing in our community. Every so often somebody will be like, oh yeah, I made another one. Oh yeah, I made another one. <laughs> it really warms my heart. So I'm glad that you guys have found that so useful. This is from Elizabeth. I love this so much. Look at that bobbin. It is chock-a-block. Cluck, cluck, four ounces by the skin of my teeth. Is it ever? Elizabeth, you did a great job there. Just fill her up. So good. And then last but not least, this is from Kat, um, a small moth brooch update. She's almost finished. And actually for those who follow her, I will post this next week for you guys on the show to give you one last update. Um, she finished it. So from the time that I put the show notes together for last week's show, she has since finished it. So I will show it to you next week because it is phenomenal. It is so, so much fun. And uh, it's just so much, so much fun. Um, we did find moths. Um, I think I had mentioned to you guys that I was really worried that there were moths. The M word came true. So uh, in the bottom of my sock drawer, there was a like a little infestation of them. So we think that we've isolated them. We think we've been able to, like we cleaned it all out, found it. What happened was the reason why I didn't know that it that they were there was because they'd actually gone like they were inside a couple of the socks. So by just looking at them and kind of rooting around in the in the drawer, you'd never know they were there. It wasn't until I actually looked inside. So I went through every single sock and looked inside and looked around. So they ruined my Hauser plied socks and they ruined one of my cable plied sock pairs. Um, but really out of all of the socks that I've done, I think I had like 20 pairs in that drawer. There's only the two that got wrecked. So the other thing they got was my, um, um, my, one of my sweaters. So they got my pink velvet, which is a pattern by Andrew Maori. It's, I, mine was knit in coral with a contrasting dark teal blue yoke. And, um, they got into the side of it just under the arm, like down by the hem. 
and I was able to get yarn that was a close enough match to the original Jameson's two ply spin drift that was now a canceled colorway. But I was able to get the, the colorway that's close enough that, um, and then graft it and, and fix it. So it actually looks like it's knitted. Like I didn't have to do like a woven swatch or like I didn't have to graft over it. I could actually like um, knit it. So because of that, you actually can't tell that I've had to mend the sweater, which is actually pretty good. I thought that was pretty great. So I was pretty upset when I found the sweater. Um, I was, I was pretty upset when I saw the sweater, the socks, I was like, Oh, that sucks. But then the sweater, but I was able to fix it. So that was good. Um, yeah. What do you do when you get moths? I, I'm still kind of trying to figure it out because now I'm worried that they're going to come back. Um, so I've put everything into sealed bags that are airtight. Um, and I've wa and I don't want to wash anything right now because the weather it's too cold and nothing will dry properly. But as soon as we get warm weather where stuff could dry within a day, um, I'm going to wash everything in like really, really hot water. Um, obviously I'll be really careful about felting and, um, just lay everything out to dry and see if I can just get everything like scoured basically. Um, so, but yeah, just not fun, not fun, but it's life. It happens. That's, that's, you know, I've been pretty lucky up till now, you know, over 10 years of, of, of knitting and fiber arts and stuff. I came back to knitting in 2005 and this is the first time I've had an infestation of anything. So I, I count myself really, really blessed and lucky. So, um, for the most part, I'm pretty careful. All oh, right. They are so bad that I can't darn them. Yeah. The socks are really badly damaged. Um, I can show them to you guys. I could take a photo and I, and I could show you guys, but yeah, it, they're too bad to darn, which is really too bad. Stuck mothballs everywhere sprayed. They haven't gotten into the house. She had an infestation in her garage. That's really too bad. Dion. Yeah. You just have to be really careful. I read somewhere that if you put a bar of Irish spring soap in with your fiber yarn and woolens that deters the moths. Yeah. And the other thing that works is, um, cedar chips. Um, like cedar wood chips. Um, they don't like that scent. So that's another thing you can try. Um, <laughs> you just have to spin in it faster than moths eat. <laughs> totally. Um, I periodically do freezer rotations with my staff. We get carpet beetles here. That's great to know, Charlotte. Good. All right. Okay. So I got to go pick up the kids and I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Same place, same time. Bye everyone.